Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along um, on this uh, Thursday evening. We've got a great program tonight. Um, I'm just uh, introducing the, uh, the first speaker and then they'll be uh, handed on from one to another uh, and then come back uh, to talk at the end. Uh, we're, the program runs for about an hour. Uh, I don't know if you've all got one there. There's also a feedback form that we'd like you to fill in at the end as well. And then around about 7 o'clock, depending on how the discussions are going, there'll be refreshments and tea and coffee. Uh, obviously, you can get a drink here at the bar as well. Okay, so without further ado... I'll... Thank you. Well, we'll meet again, everyone. Um, I'm William Burton, Willie Burton. I represent the Bull White people and what we stand for in this area. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our, uh, the boundaries that borders my people, the Bulaway people, there's some land inside the Barren River Loop. I'm sure next uh, month's paper look out for it because there will be a, uh, a map in there which now the North Queensland Land Council and the Commonwealth Government is uh, adopting. And that shows all the different tribes of this area. My tribe is Bulaway. And, uh, on behalf of the Bull White people and our animals and our spirits, I like to say welcome to you all. And uh, I know that this gathering here this evening is about keeping this land the way my ancestors kept it and uh, making sure the cassowary, one of many creatures that we have here, the frogs, the birds, the lizards, all the makeup of nature is looked after. You know, uh, when I think about this with, with, with all you uh, people from the different government areas, and uh, I say to you, this maybe they shouldn't have taken us off the uh, Flora and Fauna Act in the days. You know, we would have been better off as people, you know, with all the support you are giving to our nature. <laughs> but here we are, you know. If you know, some of you might not see what I'm saying there, but that's okay. <laughs> but I feel good anyway, coming through all of that. And, uh, and I feel good that this way, I've seen Jack's working here for uh, many years. Over the years, sometimes I used to uh, snub my nose at him and say, what are you doing? You know? But, uh, and what kind of trees you planted? Do you know that tree belonged there? What? These are the questions. I personally ask myself because uh, growing up here, a lot of this land here, like the river banks was clean, it was bare, bare. And uh, it's amazing to see what your uh, team has done with this kind of area and the way that it looks lovely now. I mean, it's greening up, there's fruit trees everywhere, they're uh, returning of birds, butterflies, insects. It's working wonders in more way than one. A lot more than what the average eye can see. And uh, from my eyes, I congratulate you lot for what you are doing and in the way of preservation here. And I hope you all come to a final point of realizing that uh, in, in the point of uh, real estate, real estate is a, it can be good, it can be bad, like anything. But the way you guys, I feel, are thinking about real estate around here, I am for that idea as well, when uh, we treat ourselves equal to our nature and the surroundings that we live in. And as I said to my people here, on the very same grounds here last week, we live in a very, very unique area, I have to remind my own people that. So it's about time we start really looking after it. And uh, I'd like to be, and my organisation would like to be of more help. You can get through to me and my people through Joe. She has a good contact with us. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future because this is a great, great thing that's going on right now. I'd like to say congratulations to you all for this whole concept, working this idea forward, and hopefully it comes through for, for nature's sake. Thank you. So thank you, Willie, for your welcome and reminding us of your connection to the land. My own connection came about one fine day 30 years ago. 
Soon after I arrived on this green and warm place, after a drive around the tablelands, my dog was due for a pit stop. We were on the Kennedy Highway, just short of the Coranda village. I turned right into a bit of a track, no fun and road then, and as I came up a small hill, now Paddy Ronan Lane, a wonderful view of green hills spread before me. I was mesmerised. I got out of the car and found my mudguard had nudged a handmade for sale sign lying low in the grass. I looked at it and looked out over the hills and burst into tears. I'd come home, my home forever, a place I would come to value highly and love. We can't help noticing that our environment is under pressure. Notwithstanding climate change, there's the clearing that our neighbours are doing, there are applications and subdivisions on large tracts of land that we always thought would remain wild. There's increased traffic on our roads, more noise, more houses, more constraints, more dead animals, dead wildlife due to dog and cat attacks and road kills. Do we feel powerless? Do we feel victimised? Do we feel frustrated and sad? Do we wonder if there's anything we can do to protect our lifestyles, our natural environment and the critters within it? Planning by residents for Coranda is not new. Some 20 years ago, a group of us won an Australian Institute of Architects award for our attempt to plan for Coranda's regional and environmental future. It was, a it was a town plan aimed at identifying the environment, what the environment would allow for housing and subdivisions and where areas of environmental significance should be preserved. It was a plan by us to inform our governors, Maribyrnong Shire Council, about what town planning we believed was needed for our wet tropics area. For a few years in the mid-2000s, when Marimba Shire Council had a divisional system, Coranda enjoyed having wet tropics representatives on council. Planning was more balanced for a while. The Coranda community was becoming better informed and we were challenging in the courts bad decisions made by council and winning. But for the most part, as is the case now, we have been governed by a Mariba-centric council, Dry Tropics Council, which has little sympathy for appreciation or understanding of this wet tropics area. Mariba Shire Council no longer has a divisional system. We don't have the numbers they, they do. And there is no prospect of Coranda having an elected representative wet tropics voice under the existing arrangements. 20 years on, there is a re-emergence of the Coranda wet tropics voice, gaining knowledge of our surroundings and the extraordinary values of our forests within which we live. We can thank Joe Martin, Stephen Nowakowski and the informed and energetic team gathered around them for the fact that we are in this room right now. We are gaining mass and a powerful voice and we are reaching out to you. You are the wind beneath our wings. Tonight's discussion is about you. It's about the power you have to force change. You have a powerful advantage in that you own the land and you can determine its future. We're here tonight to discuss some of the positive things we can do, things that can empower us to take control of our surroundings. You will hear tonight there are a number of ways to protect your immediate surroundings from a simple sign that says on your gate that you love where you live, 
to a legally binding covenant that protects your land in perpetuity. Keith Smith is up next. He's pretty, he pretty well knows it all. Listen for that one thing he says that answers your question and shows you the way. Lisa Gale will give us insight into why we should take steps to look after our environment around us and how we can use the Vegetation Management Act to achieve the level of protection we need. Wedmar's CEO, Scott Buchanan, will tie in the ecological values of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area to those values on your land and how each benefits the other. The sum of the values of the properties connected is greater than each separately. He will also describe the fragility of the World Heritage Area at its narrowest section and how important conserving private land around it is critical to the integrity of the whole of the Wet Tropics Area. Mariba Shire Council has no policy or incentives plan to encourage landholders to conserve their land. We need to influence this change. So I trust you will get something useful out and inspiring out of tonight's conversation. Remember, you are not alone. We are all in this together. We are stronger as a collective. Thank you, and now it's over to Keith Smith. Thanks for the invitation tonight. Um, Keith Smith with the State Government Department, currently called the Department of Environment and Science. Uh, a little bit of a joke because the jacket I got on is the Environmental Protection Agency, the shirt says the Environmental Heritage Protection, and the badge says the Department of Environment and Science. So, a bit of a mishmash of uh, government changes. Uh, as Jack said, there, there are a number of mechanisms or tools out there for uh, protecting or maximising the protection of areas of natural and cultural significance. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the iconic level is World Heritage listing. You have national parks within the World Heritage Area. You have state forests and forest reserves, which are other forms of state-owned public land. You have uh, public purposes reserves, uh, environmental reserves managed by council. So there's sort of what we call public lands that provide uh, a level of conservation protection. And in the wet tropics area, particularly the greener area, since World Heritage listing, a number of areas have been added to the, uh, the National Park and State. Not much has happened in the last 25 years in that regard. What would, I guess in the last 15 to 20 years, um, the State Government particularly have turned to initiatives like the one I'm involved with, which is called the Nature Refuge Program, which essentially are voluntary covenants or voluntary conservation agreements which bind on titles they're binding in successes in title, and they're binding in perpetuity. So basically, uh, for uh, areas of very, very high uh, natural integrity and significance, uh, we do have a mechanism called Nature Refuge under state legislation. It's actually under the uh, Nature Conservation Act, it's the head, head legislation, which provides statutory protection for important habitat. Um, now, we're blessed tonight to have the, uh, the current owners of these two nature refuges present, but uh, we don't have a lot of nature refuges in the Karinda area because the state government's been very, very nervous about uh, applying this particular mechanism in urban and peri-urban areas. Uh, it's, it's not ideally suited to smaller parcels of land, but it's, it is ideally suited for large strategic parcels. Within the wet tropics bioregion and the wet tropics area itself, we put a lot of priority and focus on Areas that connect protected areas, areas that connect dis disjunct sections of the wet tropics world heritage area, or areas that connect national parks or state forests or national parks to um, forest reserves, or even council conservation reserves. So there are some areas that pop up in the wet tropics which are relatively small but very significant in terms of their landscape context and value. So the program basically involves a voluntary conservation agreement with uh, the landowner, or the title holder. Um, typically, uh, if someone shows an interest in the Nature Refuge Program, we talk to them uh, about 
where their property is, um, what values their property has, how big their property is, what their aspirations and intentions for the property are. If the property is of a size and significance that's, that's interesting to us, we will encourage the person to formally ask for a nature refuge agreement. Um, the priorities of the state have varied quite a lot over the last 20 years with uh, nature refuge agreements. And there's been an overwhelming priority towards increasing the percent of Queensland under protected areas. And you'll hear a lot about this leading up to all state government elections. Um, previous governments have targeted 4% of the state under protected areas. Others have targeted 7% of the state and even more. So unfortunately, five and 10 hectare blocks in the wet tropics don't contribute greatly to the percent of Queensland. So some of our tasks have been chasing big areas, big cattle properties on Cape York, partnering up with the Bush Heritage Australia, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and other organisations to acquire big areas of land, manage them for conservation and put them under statutory protected areas. So it's been a little bit frustrating for people in the wet tropics, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, because a lot of people have knocked on my door, I'm just based in Atherton, and they knock on the door and said, look, we'd really like one of these things over our property. And uh, I haven't been able to help them out. But in more recent times, the um, Queensland Trust for Nature have uh, risen. Uh, they were initiated um, by the state government. Uh, they are now a non-government entity. Um, they buy land, they protect land, and they own sell land. They're a revolving fund is what we call them. But they're also allowed to outsource or do assessments on nature refuge properties. So they can pick up areas that the state government might decide isn't a high priority for their own staff like myself. Um, so it, it is possible in this part of the world. In terms of the hierarchy of protection in Queensland, the Nature Refuge or the Nature Refuge Covenant is probably the highest level of security you can get in Queensland. Uh, below that you have things like uh, statutory covenants under the Land Act, which uh, someone like the local government authority and council can enter into with a property owner. We have um, voluntary declarations on, under the Vegetation Management Act, and Lisa will talk about that after me. Uh, we have voluntary mechanisms like Land for Wildlife and, and, and a number of mechanisms, and Jack's mentioned it's sometimes it's simply putting a sign in the front of your gate saying, I know that I've got important habitat, I'm proud of it, and uh, whilst I own this land, I'm going to look after it. Um, so it may not have any punch, it may not have any statutory protection uh, or limitations, but at least it's a start. Uh, it's also very handy for scientists. I might add that the Land for Wildlife program was one of the, uh, the flashing beacons for a lot of people doing science because they felt that if they saw a Land for Wildlife sign on the front gate, they could walk in and not get shot or eaten by a dog. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a sign of somebody that understands the value of their property and they're prepared to manage that. And, uh, certainly Cathy and Joe will talk about what some of the other councils or local government areas in Queensland are doing, but. Obviously in South East Queensland when you've got a rapidly growing population, uh, a rapid increase in the rate return from those shires, they're quite generous in what they do for the environment and some councils have really, really outstanding programs for uh, enticing people to protect their own habitat, rewarding them, paying stewardship payments, giving them rate relief, so there's you know, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast and around Brisbane, um, great place to be if you've got habitat. Um, in this part of the world, not a lot of reward for it. So with the Nature Refuge Program, um, we do run small grants for landowners where they can um, seek some funding assistance of up to $10,000 a year from our program. Uh, the government of the day won't commit to that in perpetuity, so we go from year to year seeking approval to continue that program. But anyone that enters into our program does it out of their own commitment for future generations or their commitment for protecting the environment. Uh, there's nothing in it for you. You, you, you. There's no financial benefit for you. There's no um, uh, relative benefit other than the knowledge that you're protecting that area in perpetuity for future owners, future generations, or uh, simply because you don't trust what the government might do in 10 or 20 years time. That's probably about it for now. I'm sure in the discussion session you'll have uh, some questions of all of us and we can explore some of these things a little bit earlier, uh, a little bit further. But so what I'd like to do is sort of pass on to Lisa and um, Ingrid from the Vegetation Management Unit within the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy uh, to talk about a, another mechanism and other things that are happening with the state government in terms of vegetation protection. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thanks very much. Okay, um, hi everyone. Thanks for inviting us tonight. We really do appreciate getting out and talking to people uh, and landowners and doing these types of events. So feel free to invite us um, whenever you can <laughs> and we'll, we'll turn up because um, if you guys don't know what the legislation is and we're not telling you, then it makes it hard for anything to actually happen. Uh, so as um, Keith and Jack said, my name is Lisa Gale. I'm uh, one of the senior Natural Resource Management Officers with the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. I'm based out of the Mariba office. Uh, I've been with the department for about 10 years and most of that's been with the Vegetation Management Unit. Uh, I've also got with me tonight Inga Camps. Uh, she's a Natural Resource Management Officer. Uh, she's based in Cairns. So we have offices in Mariba and Cairns uh, and then some in Townsville as well for those people who might live closer down there. So what we'll be talking to you tonight is just about the Vegetation Management Act and the voluntary declarations under that act. Um, but firstly, the Vegetation Management Act was introduced in order to help protect uh, vegetation, but also to help regulate the impacts of clearing vegetation on the environment, so things that are, are quite sensitive. Um, so we regulate and conserve um, Remnant vegetation, in the most part. We also regulate impacts on uh, certain types of regrowth and also on declared areas. Uh, and we do that by making sure that any clearing or any activities are not going to cause land degradation. Uh, they're not going to um, uh, cause any loss of biodiversity. Uh, we're going to, what we need to try and make sure that we're maintaining ecological processes, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and also allowing for sustainable land use. So we all know that vegetation is important and the role that it, it does play. In particular, in this part of the world, uh, we're also um, really concerned about the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. That's a government priority at the moment. Uh, and um, Inga will talk about some of the, or briefly, about some of the changes that have happened recently with the vegetation management framework. Um, but also, it's not all just about land degradation and, and impacts on the reef reel. I'm also concerned about um, you know, connectivity in the landscape in that broader area as well. Um, so we look at um, not only uh, regulating the impacts of any clearing, uh, but the Vegetation Management Act does provide provisions to actually uh, further protect vegetation that people might have on their properties. Uh, so I'll be talking about two things tonight. One is the voluntary declarations. The other, very briefly, is about a, a new provision that's only come out with the recent reforms that have happened. So it's another way to further protect, or a different way anyway, to protect um, some of your vegetation on your property. And as Pete said, these are all different mechanisms, so whatever works for you um, will be the one to choose. And yeah, there's just a lot of different types, um, making it really flexible. Uh, so I'll talk about the voluntary declarations first. So firstly, what is a, a voluntary declaration? So with the Vegetation Management Act, there's a provision in the Act that says uh, we can, um, or a landholder can request an area to be declared as a, a um, uh, declared area. Uh, and there's a couple of criteria that they would make that request for. The first one being, uh, it would have to be a, an area of high nature conservation value. And the second one being an area subject to land degradation. So when we're talking about areas that are of high nature conservation value, we're talking about um, uh, vegetation clumps, uh, parts of corridors, uh, vegetation around wetlands and springs, um, strategic uh, clumps of vegetation that might, um, as we said, connect to, to different other uh, protected estates, or even just an area that adjoins an already protected area, so it's not a corridor or anything, it's not a clump way out in the middle, it's just an area that would increase an extent of, a, of an already protected area. So that's the one criteria, is being an area that's of high nature conservation value, and that's where most of our, well, all the voluntary declarations I know of fit under that banner, uh, but there is also um, we can declare areas if they're subject to land degradation. So that would be potentially a, uh, an area of erosion on a stream bank or something, or a, a scalded area or an area of salinity where people might want to just protect the, the vegetation in that area as well to help um, try and prevent that degradation happening. So 
why would people want a voluntary declaration? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons. Um, one is they might be uh, participating in, a, in some sort of conservation program. They might be wanting to get some carbon offsets happening. Um, a lot of our voluntary declarations are to do with development approvals where people need offsets, and one way to secure their offset is through the voluntary declaration process. Um, or there just might be landholders like you guys who, who just want to protect their, um, their vegetation on their lot. So there's lots of reasons why people get uh, or request a voluntary declaration. Um, in terms of what's required, oh, sorry, um, what's required for a voluntary declaration, there's a there's an application form. We do need uh, written consent from all the landowners because a voluntary declaration is recorded on, on the title of the land. So we do need to make sure that all the landowners agree um, for that to happen. We do also need consent from any registered interest holders. So that may be uh, if your property is mortgaged, we would need um, consent from the bank because obviously it does protect, um, affect um, property prices potentially or resale value. Um, or you know, if you've got an ergon easement or something running through the area that you, that you want to do, obviously ergon would, would want to consent to, to having this protection on as well. So depending on, on your property and if you have any registered interest holders uh, for that property, we would also need their consent. Um, we need some sort of uh, explanation of why you actually want to protect it. So a lot of times that's just want to be, going to be because you think it's high, high conservation value, you know, it's got X number of species, uh, it's a big patch of rainforest or whatever the case may be, or maybe you're planting up a corridor and you just want to protect it, but some sort of explanation of why you're actually requesting the voluntary declaration. We also need information to be able to map the area. So obviously, um, we need to be able to know where it is. Uh, that's, there's two things that, that we do with that information. One is you actually get a, a declared area map, it's called, which shows, there's an example of it on the board here, that just shows the area over uh, an image so that we all know what we're talking about. Uh, and we also need that because it also results in what's called a property map of accessible vegetation. And that's the, the thing that will change whatever the vegetation is mapped as to a Category A area. So a Category A area you may have seen on our maps is, is bright red and that identifies um, a declared area. Um, so we need that spatial information so that we can accurately map those areas so we, we're all clear in which areas are declared and which areas are not declared. Uh, we also need a proposed management plan that, that has to be signed by the landowner. So with the management plan, um, once you get a voluntary declaration, uh, there are still exemptions for clearing that would apply to that land. It doesn't um, negate all of the exemptions that are available. Um, most of those exemptions are to do with safety, and we're never going to not allow people to clear for safety purposes. Uh, but there are a couple of other exemptions which potentially you could do in a Category A area, uh, which you know, building a house, putting in new um, you know, new sheds, new, new constructions, um, uh, clearing for weed control or um, fence lines, things like that. So there, there are some other exemptions which may be applicable, which you actually don't want to do in, in your declared area. And that's where your management plan uh, can also assist. So you can actually um, just having it as a Category A area does increase the, the regulations on it, uh, but as I said, it does allow some exemptions to, to keep occurring, but that management plan can further reduce the number of um, exemptions that could apply to that, that land. Uh, what that also does allow the management plan is to actually manage that area for conservation purposes. So if you do have a heap of weeds in there, you can write your management plan to say, well, I actually will need to clear a bit for my weed management purposes. Uh, but I'm not going to be clear for all, all this other stuff. Um, so you can actually put in the management plan what your management activities will be to return that, that area to um, a state of, um, of where you want it. Um, whether that, that is to, you know, if you've done some plantings to, to a remnant status or if you've got pretty much intake rainforest, then there might not actually be much management to do. Uh, but you may just want to restrict some of those clearing exemptions further through that management plan. So the management plan, um, is, is a great tool to actually be able to identify what you actually want to be able to be for in that area and what you will not also um, 
permit clearing for. So it does outline you know, what, what you're not going to allow as well. Uh, but in saying that, we will always allow clearing for safety. Um, the other um, thing that you can also apply for is what's called a... Where have we gone by? Go back. <laughs> Um, a draft, uh, oh sorry, a clear area code. So if, so say for instance you had a big parcel of um, massive block with your rainforest or vegetation on it and you, you put a declaration over that area, but then you actually were planning to subdivide that area, it could be that you actually make your own code of what you would allow um, you know, clearing in that area for. So any assessment uh, of a development application would be against that, that new code. Um, and you would be satisfied that in the future um, the code that would apply to any development assessments would be this, this new code that you had over the, the area to begin with as well. Um, so that's more for if you're proposing sort of developments and you want to protect the area first. Um, so in terms of the process that happens, people put in a request to us for a voluntary declaration. Uh, we have a look at it. We will provide them back with an offer um, showing you know, maps of the area and also the management plans or whatever. Uh, and then the landowner would agree to that and we'd all sign everything. Uh, and then what happens is they would receive a declaration notice, they'd receive the declared area map, they'd get the, the property map of accessible vegetation or the PMAF map on their property, um, they'd have the management plan all finalised and, and signed, uh, and then also the, the declared area code if, if that's relevant. So the area would become mapped as a category A on the regulated vegetation management map. So that's the map we use to determine what's accessible vegetation and what's not. Um, and category A areas are red. So if you, if you haven't um, had a look at the maps so or you're not really sure um, what we're talking about, we do have uh, an iPad here which we can download or have a look at the Queensland Globe. Hopefully you all know about the Queensland Globe. Um, anyone? No? <laughs> Some people? It's a fantastic um, data source. Uh, the whole of, well, the most of the Queensland Government's information is uh, being put on the Queensland Globe and there's always more information being added all the time. So that, those maps that um, he had up first. A lot of that information, and I'm not sure where those came from, but a lot of that information is on the globe. So we have property boundaries, we have um, you know, cotton plan numbers, we've got all the vegetation mapping, all the uh, protected area state, all water courses, um, all, and it has all this stuff about trade and all, all sorts of things on there. It's a really a, amazing uh, resource that you can use, and it's, it's all of overlying imagery as well. So that, that's a really good um, tool to use, but one of the things it does have on is all the vegetation management information, and the main one that we use being the regulated vegetation management map. Um, so that'll show your area as category A. Uh, I'd also mention that it does go on title, and once again, it is binding for all future owners as well. It stays on title if you sell, sell the place. Um, with the voluntary declarations, because there's a management plan, there also is uh, a management schedule and a reporting schedule that needs to go along with that. So it does depend on what's in your management plan as to what that monitoring and reporting will look like. If you've got a, a patch of intact rainforest that you're actually not doing anything to, it may be that we just want to report you know, every two years, every five years, or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but if you're actively managing an area um, with planting and whatever, we probably want um, more regular reporting, at least in the, in the first instance, just to make sure that everything's on track as well. So there, there is a, an ongoing reporting requirement with the voluntary declarations. Uh, in terms of um, clearing, as I said before, once you do have a, a voluntary declaration on your property, there are still exemptions that would apply, uh, noting that that management plan may restrict some of those. Uh, people can still apply for a development approval to clear that vegetation as well. Um, but through the, the development assessment processes, we would require what's called a better environmental outcome for that clearing, which basically is, is very similar to an offset. So people can potentially still apply for, for clearing in that area, but we would want something pretty special in return. Uh, we can also amend management plans and things on agreement if we need to for any, any reason. 
In terms of when a voluntary declaration may end, uh, depending on what the management outcomes are, uh, would depend on, on when, because they can end. So if you were planting up um, a lot of area in the corridor and you just wanted to protect it until it became remnant status, then once you, you'd have that as your management outcome and then once that, that status was met, we could remove it. But you may say in your management plan, I actually want to keep this forever like this. And in that case, obviously, then yeah, there'd be no reason to, to remove it because the, the management outcomes would, would you yeah, know, so there's no end to them. The only time that could change is if um, if it's not in the interest of the state, and that's when we're talking about sort of major projects where you know at land acquisitions and those sorts of massive things where where the government can basically do what, do what it wants sometimes. Um, next slide. So that, that's a, an overview of the, the voluntary declarations. We've brought some guidelines for that uh, on the table here with some request forms. We've also got our cards there as well um, for any information. If anyone has any questions, obviously afterwards, also let us know. We can write our actual numbers on there. That's just, just a, a general number. So I also spoke about um, the recent changes to the vegetation management framework and introduced a new provision. Um, and this is what we're calling, I'm not sure if will change the name at some point, but at the moment we're calling it Category A by Agreement. Um, so there's a, a section in the Act which basically says if we all agree, we can make an area Category A. Uh, so with this, all we need is it, it's really just the same as a, a PMAP, a Property Map of Accessible Vegetation. So we just need a, an application form, the landowner's consent, um, there is an application fee for that, and then enough information to, to map the boundary of the area. Uh, so once again, the area is mapped as category A on, on the vegetation map, and it is registered on title. Um, for this one, we don't need uh, any consent from registered owners, oh, sorry, registered interests. Um, however, we always recommend that if it is going to affect your property in some way, um, you might want to have a chat to them and, and get consent anyway. Um, but the category A by agreement is really just a, a um, a remapping exercise of remapping parts of your property. So just on the last slide that I'll be talking about, I just got a, a bit of a comparison of the difference between the two. So when we're talking about voluntary declarations, there's no fee for that. Um, it is a more involved process, but there's no application fee or, or anything for that. Whereas with the Category A by agreement, then there is the PMO fee. At the moment, it's 345-ish dollars, so it's not a huge amount. Um, but there is a, there is a fee. Uh, in terms of the criteria for a voluntary declaration, it does have to be an area that's of high nature conservation value or an area subject to, to land regulation. Uh, but that's very broad and, and general. Uh, and could, in terms of high nature, high nature conservation value, could just be just about anything really in the tropics. Um, with your Category A by agreement, it actually has to be Category X first. So Category X is areas that have been cleared um, generally, or um, they're white on the map anyway. If anyone's heard of, I've got white on my map, <laughs> that's your Category X areas. Um, so they have to be Category X areas first, and they also have to meet the criteria of either high value regrowth or remnant status. So high value regrowth, um, I think we'll talk about briefly, but um, it's just been redefined to be uh, vegetation that hasn't been cleared in 15 years, uh, so it's still fairly substantial vegetation. And then remnant vegetation is um, generally vegetation that's never been cleared, but it could just be cleared so long ago that it's back to, to what we would consider as remnant, which is um, has the species that we would expect. It's got the, uh, at least 50% of the canopy cover and 70% of the height that we would expect, and that's what we consider remnant vegetation. So the category A by agreement is a slightly easier process, however it does doesn't have the flexibility of including a lot of those other um, vegetation areas that, that you might want to actually protect. In terms of the registered interest check, for voluntary declarations you do have to get consent from your registered interest holders, so then your mortgages or your people who own easements or all things on your property. Um, you don't for category A areas by agreement, however we do highly recommend that you do, um, just for your own sake. In terms of management plans, voluntary declarations do require management plans. Category A by agreement don't. The management plans do not have to be 
highly involved or more technical, they can be fairly straightforward and simple, but it is required for a voluntary declaration. And in terms of the regulation of the clearing, so the voluntary declarations, that's done through the management plan, um, and there will be a couple of exemptions related to safety. Uh, with the Category A area by agreement, it's just through the normal, normal process. And when they end, so voluntary declaration will end on its own terms or unless it's um, of state interest um, or we're offsetting an offset, uh, and the Category A area by agreement can be replaced um, through. It's new provision, <laughs> so we, haven't, we don't really know too much about it yet, but we would be able to replace it, and there obviously would have to be some reason and, and agreement of why we would be replacing that as well. So I'm going to hand over to Inga. Um, she's just going to very briefly run through some of the major changes with the, the new framework that we've had that's happened recently before it's, um, you might be interested in, in hearing about some of those. And then also talk very briefly about um, what we do in terms of our monitoring of people who are, who are clearing. Um, we really like people you know, telling us or, or reporting clearing to us, uh, but it's also good to, to give you guys a bit more of an understanding of what we actually do behind the scenes to, to try and find out some of these things for ourselves as well. Uh, so I'll hand over to Inga. Um, so Lisa asked me to give you a quick overview of some of the changes that we've had um, that have brought about some positive changes for the protection of vegetation. So I'll keep it short because we're a little bit over time anyway. But basically um, we've got an expansion of what's called high value regrowth vegetation. That's what Lisa was just talking about before. That's uh, stuff that has been growing for uh, 15 years or more. Previously, it should have been growing for 29 years or more for it to be considered high-value regrowth, so this is a positive, and this has been expanded to different tenures as well, and now includes freehold, so you might see it popping up on some of your freehold lots, and it's called Category C vegetation. We've also seen an expansion in what we call Category R vegetation, which is vegetation that's associated with a watercourse that drains into the Great Barrier Reef catchment. Previously, only three of the catchments in that whole catchment um, can, were mapped as containing Category R vegetation. Now all of them are considered as uh, possibly <coughs> containing Category R vegetation, so that's another protective measure that's positive. We've got... Uh, uh, also, we've had, there's increased requirements where vegetation uh, is proposed to be removed from a watercourse. We've also had a, an, an additional category of essential habitat added, so species that are near threatened are now considered in our assessments when we're looking at essential habitat. Um, the, the ability to apply to clear for agriculture has now been removed and so we've got increased uh, provisions for monitoring compliance. Uh, just to yeah, touch on, on how the department regulates clearing, some clearing is still permissible and the way we assess for that is we check to see if it's regulated vegetation. If you look at this map here, the coloured areas show regulated vegetation. The transparent area is what Lisa was referring to earlier as the white area. I just turned that off so you could see what was going on. This is the drive into Coranda. Uh, the transparent is not regulated under the Vegetation Management Act, but the coloured areas are. And so we check to see if it will fit this hair, area here that doesn't have a colour on it, yeah, and then just these, these coloured areas here are regulated vegetation. So we'll check to see if there's any exemptions that apply for clearing in the regulated vegetation. If, that, if we can't find any exemptions, we'll see if there's any uh, accepted development of vegetation clearing codes that people can clear under. If, that, if nothing applies there, they may have to apply for a permit to clear in there and then yeah that's really that's as far as you go and then you're looking at clearing that can't be 
lawful, which is the next slide. This just shows you how the department learns about um, learns about <coughs> clearing when we're not notified by members of the, of the public. So we've got satellite imagery. There's satellites that are going over constantly, monitoring um, vegetative cover. This is an example of, of an instance that we had. So the top image has quite a lot more green inside of that polygon here, and then all of a sudden down here, no more green, something's going on, and then we, we look into it and undertake a compliance investigation. So we've got a lot of um, uh, technology at our disposal to keep an eye on, on clearing out there. I'll just finish up. Thanks, guys. I think just to, just to quickly finish, um, we actually have a dedicated edge hub um, office now. This is based out of Charleville. Uh, so there is a general number 135 veg, uh, which gets you to, in the first instance, Charleville, and then we do it back out people around the state. But the people who answer that phone are actually people who know what they're talking about um, and are, are trained veg officers. I mean, you wouldn't bring us as well, <laughs> but this number actually gets you to, to um, proper people who are trained in it. It's not just a call centre, and generally they're able to answer your questions or, or um, you know, answer anyone's questions like in the first phone call, they don't have to transfer you around to all over the place. So that's something that the department has, has initiated. Yeah, the main hub is based in Charleville, but you could be talking to anyone around the state um, if you do ring that number as well. Hey, there you go. Um, first off, I'd like to um, thank Willie for the very uh, warm welcome to country. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting and talking today. Um, and given my, uh, my role, uh, being the CEO of the Electronics Management Authority, also like to uh, recognise, acknowledge the traditional owners, the rainforest Aboriginal people, for all of the country in the, in the Electronics World Heritage Area, um, and uh, pay my respects and my deep respects to their elders past, present and the emerging ones. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank Jax and uh, Joe for, uh, for inviting me up tonight. Um, it's been interesting so far, and it's great to see so many people who've um, turned up on a, on a Thursday night. Good on you. Um, I think it's a really interesting subject, and, um, and I'm learning a lot today, so I hope you guys are as well. Um, just to start off, the Wet Topics World Heritage Area, um, uh, you know, as Willie and Jax have already mentioned, um, yeah, we're really lucky. We've got some fantastic country that we live within. Uh, Grand is, is a particularly special part of the um, World Heritage Area. But the World Heritage Area extends all the way down to Ta Townsville and uh, up as far as uh, Cooktown. So there's 900,000 hectares of uh, Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. When it was first declared a World Heritage Area in uh, 9 December, 1988, the amount of national park was 14%. Uh, it's now 84%. So, um, you know, when Keith talked about probably the highest level of protection, um, national park within a world heritage area is probably the highest level of protection you can get, uh, particularly for in perpetuity. Um, so that's a great result. And, uh, and we're really quite excited on this this year, the 30th year anniversary for us, uh, that the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area has had such a positive effect on, on the country. Um, and I'm really a newcomer, I've been in this role for just over three years. Um, I'm sure there's people in this audience who were here um, during the days of the blockade and uh, who were all part of um, uh, you know, uh, making this the World Heritage Area. I think the the, the key part of that is that World Heritage is, it's, it's not my responsibility, I'm, I'm not, I don't own World Heritage, in fact I don't own any land, uh, Wet Rocks Management Authority aren't landholders, um, but we, we don't, we, we're not the, the end point of all the decisions that happen. Um, World Heritage is community responsibility and, uh, and that's what's so special about the Wet Tropics, it, it was born from the community 
And, uh, and our role is to make sure and support the community to continue that stewardship. And, uh, and tonight's discussion is really a good example of that. Um, it's not about making more national parks, it's about, well, what can I do in my backyard uh, to you know, do my bit? And as Keith again, I'll point out Keith because he is the font of a lot of knowledge. Um, as Keith said, it could be as simple as that signpost, but it can go all the way up to the nature refuge and, uh, you know, as Lisa pointed out, at least for Ninga, um, you know, there's another good tool which is the voluntary conservation agreement under the uh, Vegetation Management Act. So th there are different ways that people can get involved in managing or supporting, um, looking after this, this fantastic environment that we have. From our perspective, the Wet Tropics Management Authority, um, um, the community looking after their land, whether it's in the Wet Tropics or adjacent, is just as important as, as national parks looking after the land. It all adds up and it all provides corridors for those really unique species that we have up here uh, that other parts of Australia don't have uh, and making sure that they can get from their habitat or their breeding grounds to their breeding grounds. And um, you know some of the work that's happened up in here, we saw, saw a couple of um, nature refuges being, being identified, uh, but particularly on the Afton Tablelands and the East, Avalon, uh, East Evelyn Tablelands, there's been some really amazing stuff in terms of nature refuges that have been put aside that have really boosted the connectivity uh, between protected area to protected area. And, uh, and the results that they are starting to show in terms of uh, animals being able to move from one area to the other is, um, is significant and important. One of our big challenges um, yeah, up here is, uh, is climate change and uh, climate change is going to have a real significant impact and, and you know, there's no doubt about it, there will be impacts. It doesn't matter if all the governments in the world decide to do the best, best they can um, the rate of change has already commenced and the rate of change is going to have impacts and um, uh, the way that we build resilience is by making that connectivity so that uh, species and, and uh, I'm talking about flora and fauna can move from habitat to habitat um, and particularly you know, our area of concern is our, our high altitude species. You know, they're starting to find themselves in islands where they keep moving up because it keeps getting hotter, so they keep moving to the cool, uh, and they're going to find it harder and harder to come down and, and try and get to the other high spot. So, what um, people do on their block of land to support that connectivity um, is significantly important. And, uh, and it all, always makes a difference. The other key difference that um, uh, neighbours do when they take on uh, conservation of parts of their land is they provide a buffer for the national parks or those refuge areas, and, and that's really important as well. Um, most people here would be aware that you know on the edge of the forest is what we call edge effects, and that's where there's quite significant impacts on that part of the forest because it's, it, it is exposed and so by having neighbours buffer that you reduce that edge effect or you provide a buffer for those really important habitats. So everything that people do, do in, this, in this area is really important for the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Um, I probably uh, haven't got a lot of time but I suppose the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of Granda and, and this area, not just Granda but this area Myola and Coa, is that you are in what we see as a really significant part of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. So just to the north of us is, is the Black Mountain Corridor um, and, and we're really just at the southern end, edge of that. So it's the corridor that goes from the Lamb Range up to Mount Carbine. And one of the reasons we're a World Heritage Area is because we've got um, we have this evidence of ecological processes. We've got evidence of what was happening millions of years ago, but we still see the evidence of these ecological processes happening now. And Black Mountain, is a good, the Black Mountain Corridor, is a great example of that because 
it's always been an area that has shrunk and grown, shrunk and grown, depending on the climate at the time. And so during the wetter times, that Black Mountain Corridor would expand. During the drier times, it contracts. Uh, and um, one of the unique species up here, the Myola tree frog, um, there's some re research that was done that showed that it's quite a unique species, that it's a, a, a mix between the northern part and the southern part of the opportunity when, when with that enlargement, the populations were able to come together. And there's other subspecies in the southern which, which don't have, which we know are not related to those myola tree frogs, or they're related, but they're distant relatives because of that the, uh, fragmentation. So from that perspective, um, you know, everything that people do, uh, particularly up here, is, uh, is really important. From uh, our, you know, we talked about the different levels of protection uh, that you can have on, on private properties. Um, the nature refuge, I suppose, being the zenith, but it's not always the easiest to get. And uh, Keith talked about some of the reasons, and, and they're, they're reasonable and rational reasons. Uh, the vegetation, the voluntary conservation agreement under the Vegetation Management Act is, is a great opportunity there. Um, there is a cooperative management agreement that the um, that we have, um, so there might even be people who have land up here that have a cooperative management agreement with us, but that's an agreement between the Wetchock Management Authority and the landholder. Uh, once it's sold, um, the landholder is not bound by that agreement. Um, so it's not ideal in terms of perpetuity. Um, there are, and we don't have anybody from the council, uh, unfortunately, but there are conservation, uh, sorry, uh, covenants, um, and, uh, and, and they can work, and, and particularly where the local government is committed to them, they work really well. Uh, but again, uh, they can be in perpetuity, but local governments can change uh, their mind when they change the local government. So um, there is a need, I think, uh, to look at um, how, how there could be some strengthening put to, to some of those areas. Um, other than that, um, I suppose I just want to say that uh, I, you know, I think today tonight has been really interesting. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion at the end of it because I think it will be uh, interesting. Uh, these are good questions, but really uh, uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, we live in a really uh, unique part of the world and uh, I think it's beholden on us all to do what we can uh, to make sure that it stays this way forever. Thanks. But particularly when we're talking about the wet tropics world heritage area, this is an area that's been substantially protected. And I think it's important to emphasize just how critical and how you know, really unique this area is. Firstly, in the Australian context, it's only about a thousandth of, the Australians, of Australia's continental land area. And yet, um, a major analysis which sort of looked at the biogeographic and the biological uniqueness and irreplaceability of different ecosystems on the planet so this was over 173,000 different protected areas on the planet ranked the wet tropics world heritage area as the sixth most critical and irreplaceable. Of world heritage areas, the areas it was the second most critical and irreplaceable. I think this just gives you a global perspective on what we're talking about here. Anybody from anywhere on the planet looking around would say this is absolutely critical biological and environmental real estate. You would not want to risk it um, from an international, from a global perspective for lots of different reasons. 